So, um, recently, it was my great pleasure to be invited to do a talk at a space called WeWork um, in Waterloo, which is a new workspace. It's a lovely design, fantastic views, and you realise what a privilege it is to live in London with its culture and its diversity. The compere, nice man, Marcus Fares of Dezine, and I say that because I need him to publish my work, no, not really, <laughs> um, said, have you ever experienced discrimination? And I looked at him and asked him how long we had. Um, and he said, less than an hour. So I thought that an anecdote about a conversation that I had with an eminent architect in 2015 would probably do the trick. She looked at me and she said, Elsie, you know I'm a salsa dancer, don't you? I said, um, no, I didn't. Um, well, I am, she said, and I'm a very good one. Right. Um, and you don't know how embarrassing it is for our profession to be associated with institutionalized discrimination. I'm a salsa dancer, and I dance with black men. So how can I be racist? So, when I picked my jaw up off the floor, um, I realized the huge lack of understanding of the dis difference between systemic discrimination and personal racism and how it works. So let me start by telling a little bit about where I came from. I'm also from Ghana. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I lived there till I was nine years old. My father was a diplomat posted to London by Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah. We lived in quite a nice house, and as you can imagine, in the Gold Coast in the, in the 50s and Ghana in the early 60s, not everyone did. From a young age, I was conscious that my life was very different from the lives of people around me. And at that time, in Ghana, it was very common for people to build their own houses, and my grandfather was a contractor. So growing up, it was natural to think that architecture could be a route to helping people. And when I was about nine, I decided that's what I wanted to do. By the time I came to study architecture, my family had been settled in London for a number of years, and I considered Brixton to be my home. One day, during my early studies, I took my portfolio to an elderly mentor. At least I thought he was elderly. He was actually 47, um, <laughs> for some advice. Um, he looked at it, and he got very excited, and he said, you must apply for this college. But then he added something which I'd never forgotten. He said, when you go for your interview, and they ask you what you want to do with your degree, don't tell them you want to stay in the UK. He said, tell them you want to go home to Africa and practice there. If you tell them you want to stay here, they'll start thinking in terms of you taking jobs from local architects. He meant well, and I tried to argue that home was Brixton. <laughs> but then I did what he'd recommended, and I got in. But unfortunately, he was right. That story, and the original one, says a lot about attitudes which are still all too common in institutions which govern architecture in Britain today. British architecture is dominated by men of a certain age, race, class, and color. Many of them bring with them attitudes and biases from their generation, which includes um, gathering around the TV for the Black and White Minstrel Show on Saturdays, um, and um, um, Love Thy Neighbor. And those attitudes end up shaping our profession. They're still shaping our profession today. As a result, today's architects are not representative of the population in the UK, never mind in London, and there are not nearly enough women. Fewer than one in five architects is a woman. One in five. And there are not nearly enough so-called minorities. Today, the population of this country is said to be about 13% black, Asian, and minority ethnic, or BAME. That 13% is actually from the last census, about eight years ago. So it's probably higher than that now. So we represent, so to represent the people who live in the buildings and use the buildings we design, you would hope that there would be a minimum of 13% BAME representation, as well as nearly half, half the 50% um, women. But it's not even that. For BAME, it's only 6%. And you might hope that figure's improving, but it's not. 
Between 2011 and 2014, the number of architects from BAME backgrounds fell, and it fell by a lot. And it's been stagnant since then. So the question is, is architecture serious about developing a pipeline for the brightest and the best? Because if it was, architecture would look like the British Olympic team. <laughs> I, I, I believe that the pipeline bringing young people, women and people of colour and working class students into my profession is fundamentally broken and it must be fixed. Architecture in this country must get serious about bringing talent into our profession. There are many reasons why the pipeline is broken. To qualify as an architect, which is a seven-year course, you have to do three years of undergraduate study and then a placement in an environment which gives you the opportunity to get practical experience. Then you have to do a master's before you can qualify to register as an architect. Any aspiring young student might expect that this works a bit like a conveyor belt, with each section leaving you more qualified than the last, and with your teachers pushing you towards, um, towards the next stage. That's how it's supposed to work, but it doesn't. Some schools will help you find a placement to give you the work that you need. They'll give you connections and introductions and encouragement. Others don't. One young black student, Amira, explained what happened to her after she graduated. I started sending out my CVs, she said. I'd finished my undergrad, but I soon found out that it was actually a lot harder for me than for anybody else. I couldn't get any responses back. Everyone else was getting work. They seemed to be fine. Um, but I knew that my work was definitely as good, if not better, than theirs. And this is coming from someone who felt not very confident. So she'd hit her first problem. It's not good enough to be good enough. You have to know the right people, and the right people have to know you. As she put it, you need patrons, mentors, connections, people who know things about the industry. And when she realized that, she changed her strategy. She made a point of networking, and I'm now proud to have her as my, as my mentee. The more industry relies on personal connections for advancement, the more likely it is that unconscious biases it will exist. The reliance on connections means that the pipeline we rely on to bring talent into the profession sets more store by strong handshakes than by the strength of your portfolio. Anyway, um, Admir Amira was about to discover her next problem. Um, around about the same time, she read an article by a black undergraduate who said that um, he had changed his name on his CV because he had, in quotation marks, an ethnic sounding name. So she began to wonder whether it was her name that was the reason she couldn't even get a call back. Never mind getting discriminated against by anyone in the room, she said. I couldn't even get into the room to be discriminated against. <laughs> and once you realize that, you start to take matters into your own hands, she said. Another, another friend who had an English-sounding last name changed her name around and sent out her CV with her English-sounding name being most prominent, and she got better traction that way. She wasn't even using a false name because it was her real middle name. But, said Amira, some people feel that's dishonest and they won't do that. What does it say about our profession that people feel they need to misrepresent themselves and who they are in order to get a fair chance? What message are we sending to young people about our values, about whether we value talent and hard work? Then there's a the question of cost. To become an architect, takes a minimum of five years' study, as I've said, two years' work experience. That's expensive. And then you have to do the trips abroad, so, which are compulsory. So a trip to Barcelona or Berlin might cost you anything up to um, six or seven hundred pounds for a few days. And once you leave, you're looking at a salary of 18,000, and that's not a lot of money, especially when you've worked for seven years. And um, the, cost, the course costs 9,000 a year, so some undergraduates leave with debts of over 100,000. 
at the end of the course. So these are not the words of someone who is sanguine about making their way into a profession. But so many young people are really committed to architecture, and we have to give them credit for that. Architecture today is an international business. The more experience you have, the more work that you're likely to get. So that brings me to the question of the Royal Institute of British Architects. The good news is that REBA, as we call it, is changing. And I've been a trustee at REBA for many years. I stood for president, as the compere said, in 2018. And people keep saying, ah, you were the losing candidate for presidency of REBA. But actually, I wasn't. I was the runner-up. He was the losing candidate. <laughs> 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 Um, and it's an organization that I became involved with, with some trepidation, when I was invited to be a role model in 2014, and I think you can probably understand why. Given the lack of diversity in the profession, we must boost the pipeline, we must boost the pool of talent of diverse students into British architecture, not least because so many students come from, the Af from Africa and the diaspora to study architecture in the UK, and it costs those students and their, and their families an awful lot of money and heartache to make sure that they can come here and study. So we must, make, we must do everything we can to make the profession as open to those talented young people as possible. Because most of those, uh, those young people, when they go back to Africa, are the people who will be designing infrastructure who will be designing the homes that our continent so much needs and deserves. Since we had a campaign in 2017 in com commemoration of young Stephen Lawrence, whose tragic murder um, was, um, was um, 25, tw now 26 years ago, we have now 10 BAME architects on REBA Council. So REBA now has an opportunity to become part of the solution. Firstly, we know that the best way to fix the problem of diversity is not through the same old voluntary approach which has failed for decade after decade after decade. Secondly, REBA is now tackling the, is the, the issue of institutionalized discrimination, racism and gender discrimination, not through salsa dancing, as my friend suggested, um, but through policies and procedures and good governance. We at REBA accredit educational institutions so that students are allowed to proceed from one stage to the next. And that gives us an awful lot of power to help people and to help those institutions to fix the gateways into architecture. We need to change the norms in British architecture so that there is more that we can do. So there's more that we can do for those young people. For instance, we can encourage a culture of impartial, so-called blind recruiting. It's not hard. No photos on CVs. Um, and set tasks representative of the skills that we need to recruit. Then pick the best impartially. Statistics show that this is the best way to find those whose talent aligns with the needs of our profession. Since we want to push against unconscious bias, this is an excellent way to start. We must encourage architecture courses to fund their trips abroad properly, and we have to decolonize um, the, the prospectuses and the curricula, so that whatever your background, you can afford and you are welcome in the profession. We must set clear targets to reverse the decline of BAME and female representation in the industry. And we must fix the culture of inflexible working hours, which makes architecture so inhospitable to any architect who dares to have a family life. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If we're serious about developing a pipeline for the brightest and the best, if we're serious about making sure that race class, gender, and sexuality, 
not only doesn't make a difference, but is actually considered to be beneficial to your experience and understanding of architecture, there are just a few actions that we need to take, and we need to do these sharpish. And this matters. Why? In the end, it comes back to that instinct I had at the age of nine, that architecture can be a way to help other people, to share our privileges, and to make the world a better place for everyone. Unfortunately, we only, think, we only seem to see things more clearly when things go wrong. Look at the Grenfell Tower and the loss of life. Look at the UK's housing crisis. Look at climate change. As architects, we are involved in leading the design to the next wave of 20th century architecture and infrastructure. How much are we doing as a profession to make sure that when architects are in those design meetings, they grew up in a building like Grenfell Tower? And, and how many of those architects have a mum or an uncle or a granny who lives in a flat or lives in those buildings that we're designing? Look at the climate emergency and the way that we plan villages, suburbs, towns and cities. A young female architect I know said to me recently, if you don't have women on design teams, things just aren't thought about. For example, when I think about urban design, I think a lot about how this affects the lives of people. Sometimes, when we're planning spaces, I just want to say, you can't do that. I would never walk down there. I would never cycle down there. As a woman, I have a very different experience of the city. My profession needs to get the right mix of people in its leadership to make, to make these points matter. And if we do that, of course, architecture can be a way of creating massive positive change. In order to help the people who most need support, we need to notice them, we need to recognize them, we need to admire them, and we need to respect them. And that's why diversity in architecture matters so much. Because the buildings that we build, the homes that we live in, the cities that we plan are for everybody. So everybody, everyone, should have a say in designing them. The irony is that if architects really think about diversity and diversifying what they offer people, they'll probably be more commercially successful. The, the new demand is there for new ways of living, excellent buildings, homes and offices, like the WeWork space I mentioned before. In the end, architecture isn't abstract. It's about enabling people to have a good life. It's about making sure that our homes are safe and enjoyable spaces, that our families are comfortable, that our workplaces are effective, that our courts are designed to encourage us to trust that justice can be delivered there, that our transport systems are working efficiently and welcome, and, and welcome us and are easy to use so everyone can benefit from the variety of life in our cities. And our cities themselves are built for the communities they serve. To do that, you need to involve everyone, regardless or maybe because of their gender, ethnicity or social background. And that's what I've been campaigning for for longer than I care to remember. And the as the cliche goes, we still have a lot of work to do. I still have a lot of work to do. So thank you for listening.